read for us. This is God's word. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is God's word. Today's our uh, last day in Philippians, like I said. We spent the past couple months or so unpacking uh, Paul's unpacking, we're packing Paul's unpacking, of God's call for his people to rejoice. And even though joy isn't explicitly defined like it's a textbook, it, even though it's not explicitly in the letter, the implications of joy, the message around joy, um, it, it, is, it is profound. And there's a lot to unpack. And just because we spent the past couple months going through Philippians, please don't think that like you've nailed or you've grabbed, or you've grasped this idea of joy. There's so much more to unpack, even how that plays out in your own life. And so um, that in itself, I, I think, is something we have to constantly battle and fight through, this understanding of joy, because uh, I think I've said this almost every week, there's a fundamental difference between happiness and joy. Joy is a kind of blissful happiness, but happiness is really based on circumstances, and, and we're nailing that hard today, okay? Happiness is based on circumstances. It's based on different things, ups and downs of your life, where joy is, is an internal thing. It's an internal thing where you're engaging with something eternal. And so, let me frame it this way. Paul's going to get into this today, but let me frame it this way. Um, what if God gave you everything you asked for? And, and, and I know some of you are tempted to think, you, you think it's like a trick question or something like that. You know, well, I asked for all the blessings in Christ. No, like, you really asked God for everything, anything and everything, and God just gives it to you. Uh, like, like, if you're struggling with this idea of joy, and, and you're not going to stand up in the middle of congregation, in the middle of service, and disagree with the pastor, but in the back of your mind, you're like, how can that really be true? How can it be that joy is not based on circumstances? And maybe you're going through a rough season in your life, and so it's hard for you to get your head wrapped around that truth. But maybe there is a part of you, even as a Christian, where you're just not convinced. How can joy be, be separate from circumstances? And so I ask you the question, okay, well then what if God actually gave you everything that you wanted? And, and now you sit down, you create a, a, a spreadsheet, you nerd out on this question, and, and you go at it, you go ham on everything that will, that will give you joy, and you scientifically, quantitatively figured out what it's going to take for you to be content. You have figured out, down to the dollar, what it's going to take for you to be content, and, 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 and you press the enter button on the Excel spreadsheet, and then out comes, it says on the bottom, it says, crazy rich Asians, right? That's what it's going to take for you to be content. And then you can say, I can do all things to him who strengthens me, right? Look at my palace, right? That, that's what you're doing. By the way, anyone here watch Crazy Rich Age? Raise your hand so I can judge you. Just kidding. I, I saw it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just so, oh, no. No, really. Raise your hand. I just want to get an idea. Okay, about half, half of y'all, and then the other half is lying. Okay, that's fine. So um, it's, it's so ridiculous and absurd, and there's going to be some mini spoilers that I'm going to give you, but it's really not a big deal. Um, like, there's rich, 
and then there's that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, like, you know, you, you, you know when you watch something on YouTube or movie or TV, and, um, and there's a little bit of part of you that gets envious? Um, oh my gosh, that dress is so gorgeous. Must be nice, you know? Like, you don't say it, but you think that. Bro, bro, bro. Like, you're talking to yourself, bro, look at that car. Oh my gosh, must be nice. I watch Crazy Rich Asians, and I didn't think that, like, at all. And I'm not trying to be overly spiritual and super-duper Christian. Like, literally, I was watching that movie. I'm just like, this is absurd. <laughs> like, do you really want this? Like, they're getting married, and then water comes down the aisle. If that happened to me, I would get pissed. I would be like, who flooded the toilet on my wedding day? Like, are you kidding me? You couldn't wait till after, like... Like, I'm just thinking about this. That's literally what happens. Like, water comes down, and everyone's like, oh, this is so gorgeous, right? Um, God gives that to you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everything you wanted, everything you asked for, God just gives it to you. Now, at first, it's probably going to be pretty amazing, right? Uh, having all the money, having all the cars, water in your wedding, all that stuff, it's like amazing at first, at first, at first. Right? Now, now you play that out. Now this isn't the point of the movie, but something that I realized, even in a non-Christian, non-Christianly made movie, who in that movie do you, do you, can you spot and say that person is rejoicing? This person in the movie seems to be truly blissfully happy and content with where they are. Everyone in that movie is just driven for more. And it's not even a Christian film, you know what I'm saying? And so you play it out. You play it out, and, and you, you act, or you, you, you want to imagine, you want to fantasize. God literally gives you everything you asked for. And do you think that that's actually going to bring this contentment in your life, where you can say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me? That will lead to disaster. I once heard a pastor say this, and I think it's so true. A young bored, and rich man or woman, I mean, there's nothing more dangerous than that. When your sole purpose in life is just figuring, you wake up in the morning and all you're thinking about is, how am I going to spend my money today? You know, how am I going to make more money? How am I going to fulfill my purpose in the day by spending money and gaining and gaining and gaining? And, and you play that out. There's nothing more dangerous. There's nothing more destructive. There's nothing more disastrous than that. And I know that's a very extreme uh, perspective way to put it, but really what I'm trying to get you to understand, what I, how I'm trying to set up our time, is that, is that really what's going to bring you joy? I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in an eternal sense, not a, not a fleeting happiness, but, but a foundational anchor joy that's immovable. That, that, that's what Paul's going to say here. Um, You see, God isn't after our physical and material contentment. That alone, I think we need to just wrap our head around and wrestle with. Um, now, and now if, you're, if you're living prosperously and you're doing well for yourself financially and whatever, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But can you honestly say as a, as a Bible-believing Christian that that is what God is after, that God is really, that God exists to serve you and to make your life materially happy and content. You see, that's not what joy is. God's not after your material blessings. He's after your joy. Um, and if joy isn't based on physical circumstances, then it has to be based on something internal. And now Paul is going to, in his own way, unpack that as he closes out this letter to the Philippian church. And there's, there's different contextual things that we can unpack, but I just want to focus and hone in on this idea of joy. And so here's how I'm going to break down our time today, okay? It's three things. It's the command for joy. So we didn't read it, but we're going to go back to verse 4, right, which is the command for joy. We're going to unpack that. And then number two, it's the testimony of joy. And then three, it's the pursuit of joy. The command for joy, the testimony of joy, and the pursuit of joy. Um, so what do I mean by the command for joy? Now Paul says again in verse 4, I know we're going really hard on this for the past couple of weeks. In verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. 
I want to revisit this again because it dictates how we interpret the rest of the text. I, I mentioned this last week that there are times when the grammar of the text really speaks to us, and so rejoice is a verb and it's in the imperative, which means it's a command. Okay, so let's think about this. The Bible is commanding me to rejoice. Okay? The Bible is commanding us as God's people to rejoice. And the fact that this is a command, I think, has some really powerful implications. Um, and, and what I mean is, how, how do we treat biblical commands? Like, how do we as a church at Livestream uh, treat commands? Like, I think we as a church, especially as an Asian church, uh, we have this tendency to view Christianity as a set of rules, right? I, I don't know if you notice this, but what I notice about uh, not just uh, Asian churches, but Asians in general, we have this tendency uh, to focus on what we haven't done and what's wrong with us and how we failed, as opposed to affirming what is good and what, we're, what we have accomplished. Um, I, I don't know if that resonates with you at all, right? You know that saying, like, you get a B on your exam. You are not Bijan, you are Asian, you know what I'm saying? Uh, funny to me, whatever. But like, um, th- as Asians, we have this idea where we focus on how we failed, right? And this whole thing, next time I'll do better, right? Instead of saying, wow, like let's celebrate what we've done. And so we take the biblical commands, right? That translates even into Asian culture and Christianity. We take the biblical commands, even, like stuff, even something like the Ten Commandments, and we think, we, we bring it to our small group, and so we say, this is how I failed in the command this week. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so if the Bible says I'm supposed to um, not hate my brother, right? Well, then um, I've hated my, my brother this week, and so I'm confessing that. And then your small group goes, okay, uh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How we, can, how we can pray for you? How can we hold you accountable, right? Or, or you might say something like, well, the Bible says to not commit adultery, okay? Well, that doesn't mean just don't cheat on your wife. That means be faithful to your wife. And so what you do is you show up to your small group and, you know, I, I lusted this week and I had committed spiritual adultery. This is how I failed. This is how I missed the mark. And then your small group, okay, your small group goes, okay, how can we pray for you? How can, you, how can we hold you accountable? And so when it comes to uh, commands in the Bible, small groups or accountability just becomes about how you didn't do something. I know I just sped through that like crazy, right? But really, that's how we treat commands, it's never about like, well, I, I, I didn't pursue something. It really just becomes I didn't do something. And so what's interesting to me is when you see clearly that Paul is saying to Christians, rejoice. Again, I will say rejoice. How many of us will actually show up to small groups of people that we trust, you know, for accountability, and then we say, I didn't rejoice this week? I've never been a part of a small group that, where anyone said that, right? And I'm not saying that something is wrong with us. You know, I'm just saying that's really, in, isn't that an interesting observation? We have like these, these different standards for rules and laws and commands that the Bible has. And that like there's like this unspoken rule where like if you, if you looked at porn, you know, this past week, right, oh, Holy Spirit is like, convicting me to share this in my small group, but then you didn't rejoice. No one's going to say that. But it's right here in the text, and it's redundantly spoken. And and so um, you might say, well, things are different for me. That's why I don't rejoice. You know, and I'm not telling you to minimize or to trivialize your feelings and, and the experience or the season that you're going through. But a lot of us, I think we say, um, well, I can't rejoice. It's hard for me to rejoice. I see it in the Bible, but I think I'm allowed to not rejoice because I'm just going through a difficult season in my life, right? And then that just kind of ends up being you just not sharing anything and just to give me my space. I'm I'm entitled to this, and you don't share anything. Um, I think some of you, you you might be going through that, and so you just kind of say, you don't understand my circumstances. Honestly, I mean, maybe I do, maybe I don't, and and I don't want to assume like I just know, but that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point. I mean, and if you can grasp even just that truth as we close out Philippians, I think you'll have gained something really valuable. Rejoice always. Um... Rejoice if your life is going well. 
Rejoice if your life is not going well. Rejoice in and every and through all circumstances. So notice, Paul does not say rejoice when you've graduated school and you've landed your job and you got your house and your car and your husband and your wife and you set up your 401k and then you can say, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. That's not what Paul says. Um, and so let me give you another implication of this command. I understand that some of us don't like commands. Um, some of us don't like to be told what to do. And, um, and I should know this as... as as an Ian pastor of a congregation like this, but it's come to my attention that millennials don't like commands, um, which is like so interesting to me. Um, and I say that because um, I'm kind of in between generations. So like, I'm like half millennial and half whatever the generation is before that. And so I kind of have both worlds. And so I kind of get both. But like w- what I come to understand about millennials is that they don't like being told what to do right? And if you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, isn't that everybody? No. In my generation, how things function was we were told what to do, and then we asked questions later, and that was acceptable. In the pastor's meetings I have every week, we don't, we don't, it's not about millennials, it's not about reaching. Like, the senior pastor, Pastor Moon, will share his conviction, and he'll go off on, like, what he believes, and he'll tell us what to do, and then I'll go, hey, PJ, what do you say? I don't understand Korean. And then I'll go, yeah, I guess we'll do that, right? And then we, and then we do that, and then, I go, and then I ask questions later. That's literally how we function. But some of you are sitting there, don't tell me what to do. I don't like being told what to do. And so what millennials like doing, and this is revelation to me, they like being coached, Right? You don't tell them what to do. You don't pave their way. You don't map it out for them. You're on the sideline, and you coach them, and you encourage them. You ask them good questions so they can figure it out for themselves. There's nothing wrong with being millennial. But I will say this. Whether, whatever generation you're from, whether you're young or old, there is such a thing as maturity and immaturity. I don't care if you're a millennial. I don't care if you're 60. I don't care if you're 15. Whatever you are on the spectrum of age, if the Bible is commanding you to rejoice, I think out of immaturity, you will say, don't tell me what to do. You coach me. You don't tell me what to do. But then I think out of maturity, even if as a millennial, as a mature millennial, you'll say, well, I don't get it, but I want to know why. Why? Why would the Bible command me to rejoice? Again, I say rejoice. I mean, you, you feel, you, you get what I'm saying? I'm not condemning you for, for being born when you were born. You know what I'm saying? If that is your culture and that is your set of beliefs, well, then you've got to believe there's growth that can happen in that. And so when the Bible is commanding us to rejoice, the response isn't, don't tell me what to do. I can figure it out on my own. I don't care what the Bible says. Really, the response should be, well, Why? And I had to really think about that this week. I'm trying to get into the mindset of a millennial, and I'm thinking, okay, as a 25-year-old male, right, and the Bible is telling me to rejoice, and I'm asking the question, why, God? It's kind of a funny question. Why do you want me to be happy, right? But it's like, why, why should I rejoice? And you know what I came to the conclusion of? You know why the Bible tells us to rejoice? Because if the Bible didn't tell us to rejoice, we would not rejoice. And if we wanted to rejoice and we went after joy, we would go about it all the wrong way which is called idolatry. You see, profound implications that we find just in verse 4. Rejoice. Again, I will say rejoice. And so out of that command, what we see is that Paul is is giving us these profound, profound implications of, of following in obedience and knowing that God isn't just telling us to rejoice because he's this mean jerk of a God because he wants us to have joy. No, he's telling us to have joy because he wants us to experience life and joy and hope now, not just when we die and go to heaven. And out of that command, I'm going to jump to verse 10. He's going to now give what I call a personal testimony of him rejoicing. And I think it's important for us to to understand what's happening here. So I'm going to read verse 10 again. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, 
and I know how to abound. In every and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So I call this a testimony because it's really honest. It's just really honest. And the more I read and study and think through Philippians, the more I appreciate how honest and and heartfelt Paul is being in this letter. Like, you realize Paul doesn't have to be this honest. I mean, if you read, I know we read it in, in pericopes and in chunks, but if you read it from beginning to end repeatedly, you really get more of a sense of how personal and heartfelt Paul is being, and and you realize that he doesn't have to be like that. He could give you these big gospel truths and just say, okay, now go do it, but now he's infusing like these personal personal convictions, and and he's getting the Philippians to really understand like what is happening in his life, And, and, and I say that because I think we need to remind ourselves what a testimony is. Um, because despite what we think, I think, I think our view of testimony is this passive-aggressive way to tell people how spiritual you are, right? And that's why we don't like it, because we just think everyone's going to think that I'm, super du- I'm trying to be super-duper spiritual, when it's really not that. A testimony is really simple. You are testifying to what God has done, not what you have done. And you find confidence in that, you could be honest with that, and you can go to even strangers and give them your testimony and tell them, this is what God is doing in my life, not me. You know, and that supersedes your fear of judgment. That supersedes your fear of people thinking wrong thoughts about you. You go and you tell boldly what God has done in your life, and you are giving your testimony. And that's what Paul is doing, and this is what he says in verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Out of that testimony, where does that come from? I mean, if, I mean, if this is the most taken out of context verse possibly in all of the Bible, well then let's put it in context. You know, let's be responsible as much as we can and understand what Paul is saying when he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Um, I don't know if you knew this about Paul, but he's been on several mission trips. And after his third mission trip, uh, he goes off on a boat because he was a uh, persecuted and arrested for preaching the gospel and he goes off on a boat and then he's shipwrecked and when I say shipwrecked I don't mean like some cheesy Bethel song I am shipwrecked by the love of God no literally shipwrecked (laughs) in the ocean right and so he's thrown off a boat and he doesn't know if he's going to live or he's going to die and now he's sitting there in the craziness and the chaos of the storm and what is he probably thinking I'm probably going to die and, and, and then he survives, miraculously, and he ends up on this island, um, and, and, and he survives that. And then, and then after that, right, he goes into a city called Lystra, and he's preaching the gospel again. And then for preaching the gospel, he gets stoned. Like, he gets stoned for preaching the gospel. Can you imagine going to your college campus, sitting at some coffee shop, with your math textbook open and you decide that you want to share the gospel with someone and then all of a sudden a bunch of cops run in and and arrest you and throw you into jail? Like, can you imagine that? Like, we would have a fit over that with all the, like, this belief about personal individualism, personal rights. We would have a fit over that. But Paul is being stoned for preaching the gospel. He didn't do anything wrong or harmful or violent. He is preaching the gospel, and he gets stoned. And what is he thinking as these boulders big enough to throw are being thrown at his head? I'm probably going to die. Like, this is it. You know, when I got thrown into the sea and I got shipwrecked, I don't know, that's God's grace, I got lucky, I don't know. Now I'm going to die. This is it. He gets knocked unconscious, and then he survives. Paul was arrested several times. And then finally, he's in house arrest that he's writing this particular letter. And he's in prison for the same reason. He's always thrown in prison. He's preaching the gospel. But to this city in particular, it was considered a disturbance. And so, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think any of us have ever been in prison. But it's not just being in the same place all the time. But it's the mental stress of not knowing what's going to happen to you. 
You don't know if you're going to die today or tomorrow or if you're just going to rot in prison. You don't know if you're ever going to see your family or friends ever again. You're just in house arrest, in chains, which I think resonates a lot with what we talked about last week in terms of anxiety. Suffering isn't just being stoned or being shipwrecked, but it's the mental health. Not knowing what's going to happen to you. So what does Paul decide to say? Right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, and, you know, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request to God today and be in the now and rejoice in the Lord now. And so in any day now, as, as he's in chains and house arrest, he's probably thinking, I might die today. And so, as you read through Philippians, you kind of get this idea of, of, of why Paul can say the things that he says. For me to live is die and to Christ is gain. He's not saying that, and hopefully someone out there gets it, like it's this mystical, foo-foo kind of saying. He's saying that because he's come close to death in his mind many, many times. And he's ready to die. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And he means it with everything that he has. Now, why, why, why do I share all that? Because think about that. Take that short bio of Paul into consideration. And now think about what he means when he says, out of that, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. Oh, so you can like jump off of a house and start flying. You guys see that Key and Peele one? I can fly. Sorry, right? I can do all things. Is that really what it means? No, that's not what it means. I can get shipwrecked and survive for preaching the gospel. I can do that. So you're telling me, like, I don't have to, like, study for an exam, but God will just give me grace and I just ace it? No, that's not what it means. I can get stoned for preaching the gospel, though, and survive. I could do that. It's a completely different mindset from my existential individual thinking, oh, I can do all things. It transforms everything about this letter. When we try to infuse our individualism into this text, and then we think, well, God exists to give me joy. You got it all wrong, church. When he says, I can do all things, it, it's Christ all over it. And so I think that drastically changes how we view that verse and how we even view the Christian life. Can God do anything? Yes, absolutely. Can God split huge bodies of water like the Red Sea? Absolutely. Can God turn water into wine like in John? Absolutely. Can God raise the dead like he raised Lazarus and Christ? Absolutely. But this passage and this entire letter has nothing to do with the supernatural and miraculous things that we think that we, it's about. It's not about having incredible faith in God and God will somehow bless you with great things. It's about joy. It's about unending, untouchable, hardcore joy in all circumstances. It's about joy when you're starving and you have no money for food. It's about joy when you have a lot of money and you get to eat whatever you want to eat. It's about having joy when you feel abandoned and you have to face loneliness. It's about joy when you're not lonely and you have the deepest fellowship with your community. It's joy in all circumstances. That is what Paul means when he says, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. And that transforms the Christian life radically. I have a lot on my plate. I just can't seem to find any time to breathe. I feel choked by all the stuff that I have. It's stress and anxiety. People are getting in my case. But you know what? I can do all things to him who strengthens me. My family's pressuring me to make money. I, I, can't, I don't have any freedom. I'm stuck in where I am. Or maybe I'm putting that pressure on myself. I just want to run away sometimes. I just want to escape and take a break. But you know what? It's okay. I can do all things to him who strengthens me. Because I have this joy that I can't shake off. I have no idea what I'm going to do after college because I'm a millennial. I don't like being told what to do. I like being coached, right? And so do I have to go back to school or should I go to work? What kind of job should I employ for? It's so much pressure and it's confusing. But do you know what? I can still take joy in my relationship with Jesus because I could do all things to him and strengthens me. This testimony from Paul tells us everything we need to know about joy. It's not joy because of circumstances. It's joy despite circumstances. Contentment means that through any circumstance or any regret or any problem or through any difficulty, any discomfort, any pain that you go through, you don't give up. Joy is saying, I don't like it, but I can cope with it. Joy is saying, I'm down, but I'm not done. 
Joy is saying, I'm hurt, but I'm not defeated. Joy is saying, I'm confused, but I'm not lost. Amen? So Paul gives this honest testimony of his joy, but he's also going to share how we can pursue joy. This is the pursuit of joy. And, and, it's, and it's hard to miss, but, but it's in there. Verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, listen to this, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So Paul says that he learned the secret of joy. He's saying he's learned to have joy in every circumstance. And I think we like to think that we could just wake up all of a sudden and we're just better Christians, like we just get it one day. But Paul's saying that being content was something that he learned. There was a learning curve in this process. Like, he didn't just all of a sudden know how the gospel worked. There was a process in that. And so he doesn't just say that in this verse, in verse 12. It's all over Philippians. Okay, j- j- just listen, okay? V- chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Chapter 1, 18 and 19. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know... I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, it will turn up for my deliverance. Chapter 2, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, and at the end of that, he says, think about these things, okay? So follow me. Thinking, knowing, remembering, considering, these don't have anything to do with circumstances, one commentator writes that in this letter alone, those words that have to do with thinking, something to do with the mind, something to do with like your cognitive space, anything that has that, that, like that kind of sense or that kind of word, 55 times, 55 times in Philippians it's used. Very, very little or nothing, in fact, in Philippians is about changing your circumstance. And this theme, this motif of joy that's weaving its way throughout all the the verses in Philippians, there's very little to do with changing circumstance, but has a lot to do with knowing, understanding, remembering. What does this tell us about joy? When Paul says learning, learning isn't a change in circumstance. Learning is a change in perspective. I think that is one of the distinct things of Christians. We just have a radically different perspective of the world and our lives. Last week, I went through some personal difficulty with a situation, and I know that sounds super ambiguous, and I promise I'm not just making it up for the sermon, but um, if you want to know, I'm more than happy to sit you down and, just, and talk about it with you. I just don't think it's appropriate at the pulpit. But I went through like a personal difficulty, and... Um, what I did was, uh, when it happened, I told myself, okay, I'm going to give myself one day to be distracted. I'm going to give myself one day to just have my own time, to just do what I want to do, you know, and just enjoy my one day. And then after that, I'm going to start processing. I'm going to learn from this process. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to pray. And then that one day was like well spent, and, but that one day turned into like five days, right? And then for five days, I was just distracted. And literally, like, Monday comes around, and I'm, Tuesday comes around, I'm trying to do my QT, right? And this is your pastor, like, confessing to you. I'm reading through Second John because that's our corporate devotionals, and nothing is happening. And I'm trying to tackle it from different angles. I'm trying to do it meditatively. I'm trying to look at the Greek, right? I'm, I'm like, trying to memorize it even. And it's like, it's like I'm hitting this brick wall. It's like I know that the Bible is important, but it's like nothing is happening you know, and, and I'm praying through this, I'm trying to, and then nothing is happening. And so, like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm just, like, so distracted. And I'm just trying, like, I'm just, I'm just like, God, I'm trying to do my QT, and nothing's happening. And so, finally, like, Thursday rolls around, and I tell myself, man, I, God, I need a breakthrough today. I just had, like, these dead consecutive days of QT, and maybe you could feel me on that, and I'm just getting frustrated. I'm like, does it have to do with my personal difficulty? I don't know what's going on. And so I tell myself, okay, Thursday rolls around. I, I, I got to have a breakthrough. I got to do something with this QT. I got to hear God's voice. And, and so um, 
Thursday morning, I'm thinking about all the stuff that I have to do. I got to prepare my Sunday sermon. I got to prepare for Lagos. I got to prepare for my small group leaders meeting on Saturday morning. I got young adult retreat coming up next week. I got to prepare for Advent in December. I got to prepare for judges coming up in January. And I'm like, maybe I should just get to work. No, no, no. I need a breakthrough. I need to do this. And so I told myself, no matter how long it takes, I'm going to sit here and do my QT until God does something. And so I went at it, I was praying, and I think the most important thing that I did at that moment was just to be honest with myself, which I think for some of us is really hard to do. I think that in and of itself is a battle. And when I say honest with myself, I'm talking about feelings and I'm talking about thoughts, I'm talking about internal things that, that you think is hard, it's not there, but it really is. And so... I didn't just think about it. I told myself, I got to write it down. I got to be as tangible and concrete as, 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 with it as I can. And so I opened up my journal. I'm looking at 2 John. I'm like, this has nothing to do with 2 John, but I'm going to write some stuff down. And this is what I wrote. I, I wrote, I feel lonely. I feel lonely. That's what I, that's what I wrote. I feel lonely. Therefore, I must be abandoned by my community. That's how I feel. I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's how I feel. I wrote, I feel insecure. So I feel lonely. I feel insecure. Why? Because of what happened. I think something about that just makes me feel like less of a man. I wrote, I feel guilty. I feel guilty as if I did something really wrong and therefore I'm stuck in my own sin and I feel like people are judging me. I feel lonely. I feel insecure. I feel guilty. So here's how I had to fight for my joy. I had to combat those lies that were masked by feelings and then I had to replace them with gospel truths. I, I had my Bible open to 2 John and, and, and I know this is weird for a pastor to say but I was like, I don't care about this right now. And for some reason, I, had to op I opened up Ephesians 1 because I know what Ephesians 1 is about and I started meditating on this because it's all about identity and this is what I read. I said, even as he chose us from the, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I'm holy and blameless. In love, he predestined us. Us, that includes me. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons of, through Jesus Christ. What have I done that God would make me his beloved son? In verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. That's a really fancy word. He lavished this riches upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. And so here's where I'm going with this. Here are my feelings. My honest testimony, just the honest truth of how I feel. I'm not concerned about if it's true or not. All I'm concerned about is am I being honest with that? So here are my feelings, and here's the truth. And this is what Ephesians says. So now this is the battle. You get what I'm saying? Here are my feelings. Here's the truth. Now here's the fight for joy. This is how we pursue joy. I feel lonely but I'm not actually lonely. I feel lonely, but I actually have access to this rich, deep, fulfilling relationship with God who is my creator and my savior and my sustainer. I feel insecure, but I'm actually secured in my identity as a, as a child and son of God. I feel guilty, but Ephesians 1 says I'm actually forgiven and freed from whatever accusation and Satan may throw at me. So this is what I want you to think about, and this is why I share this. In our pursuit of joy, if it's not a circumstantial thing, if it's not about changing your job, it's not about being, you know, uh, getting a higher paycheck or dating the right person, if it's not about those things, if, it, if it's a perspective thing, then you have to understand your thought process is more powerful than you think. Fighting for joy 
is an internal process of the heart and mind. And God has empowered you to combat that for your joy every day. And the, and, and the gospel, when, when I was practicing the gospel, when I was actually applying it, when for five days I'm distracted, I'm out in the wilderness, I'm out in the darkness, and I'm confused, I'm hurt, I'm lonely, and I start applying the gospel, it was as if this huge burden was lifted off my shoulders. And I'm not saying now I'm free completely and I don't have to do anything else. All I'm saying now is like I'm more equipped to fight that now. And so this conversation that you have in your head is real. The ongoing thoughts that you have when you're by yourself, when you're by yourself, it will dictate your joy or it will dictate your anxiety. So what this means is that if you're not sensing much joy in your life, it could just be that you are allowing feelings to supersede truth. I'm not telling you to deny your feelings. In fact, I'm telling you, embrace your feelings, but don't stay there. Bring those feelings and look at them through the lens of the gospel and filter out lies so that you can hold on to truth. That's what I mean when we say we fight for joy. Because for me, when I read passages like Ephesians 1, I just saw a bit more clearly how rich I really was in Christ. And I was thinking about how Paul says, God lavished his riches upon us. Right, that means God didn't just give me his leftovers. He didn't just give me, you know, what was, what he just came up with us on his free time. He gave me his very best, his very, very best. And if he has given his son Jesus Christ, then I can reap the righteousness of Christ. That's the very best that God can give us. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, this, all of Ephesians 1, and even all the Bible, when God is pursuing my heart and is giving me his best, and I realized something profound. That makes me a crazy rich Asian. I'm not talking about money that's going to be burned up one day. I'm talking about spiritually, I'm the crazy richest Asian. We are crazy rich Asians because we are adopted sons and daughters of God and we have a joy that is unending and lasting and we are not being dictated by the circumstances that we call happiness. We are crazy richest Asians because of joy. I really thought I would get a better response than that, but it's okay. Learning and growing and changing has to do with steps of faith that you take. It's, it's an internal process of the heart, a dialogue that you're going after. And that's just one way that Paul is expressing that. It's, it's, it's a fight of the internal heart. And you've got to fight for that church. And I'm not talking about if you're going to go to heaven or hell. In the end, if you're a Christian, your soul is secure and you're going to go to heaven. That doesn't mean you have to live in anxiety until Jesus comes back. Fighting for joy requires you to fight for truth. Fighting for joy means fighting for your identity. It means spotting the lies that you are taking up, that's taking up space in your head, taking up space in your heart, and you're saying, you need to get out of here because I am fighting for joy. I'm fighting for the cross to be real. I'm fighting for restoration to have its place in my life. Pray with me, church.